Hello, and welcome to the Collective Church Podcast. These messages are from our Sunday services at the Collective Church in Boise, Idaho. If you are new with us or just checking us out, please visit our website at collectivechurch.org. We would love to hear from you and connect with you. We pray that this message is both uplifting and encouraging. All right, good morning. How are we doing? How am I doing? <laughs> good so far? All right, um, so I have a warm-up question for you this morning. Coming out of Thanksgiving, it's going to be a, a doozy of a warm-up question. So everybody get loose. Yeah, stretch out if you have to. Um, if you don't already know me a little bit, I'm not a very serious person, so you're probably going to hear a little bit of laughter this morning. But what things do you boast in? I'm going to give you guys a couple seconds to think about that. I'm thinking it might be easy because something tells me that there might have been a little bit of boasting at Thanksgiving dinner, right? The second question I have for you is, what is your motive? What's the intention behind your boasting? That's a hard one. That's a really hard question, I think. So with Thanksgiving dinner, right, what are the common questions we get asked How's everything going? How's the new job? How are the kids' schools? How's retirement? Right? And how do we respond as humans? We probably make ourselves appear maybe better than we're actually doing. Um, And there's nothing wrong with doing great as long as um, our motives are right and our intentions. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. And as we go through these first few verses in Philippians, um, really what I was so struck by was that Paul is hitting on the condition of our hearts, which is a really difficult thing for us to pinpoint, but we're going to kind of unpack it. So whatever you read scripture in, your phone, the actual physical Bible, if you want to pull that out, we're going to be in Philippians 3. Um, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to read it for us. It's, it's aptly titled, No Confidence in the Flesh. I love that that's like the title of this passage. It says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, In regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So the short of it today is we're going to be talking about Paul's directive to put no confidence in the flesh. And in, in the Greek, that word confidence can also mean striving to please or to win one's favor by our own human effort. And instead, Paul reminds us to make our ultimate goal the value of knowing our Lord, being found in Christ, and worshiping in the Spirit of God. So, his first command. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Woo! Easy. Check. Done. (laughs) All right, here's the best thing I've been taught about um, when you're reading Scripture If something doesn't sit well, if you read something and you're like, "Mm, I don't know if I relate to that or I don't understand it or that kind of annoys me or 
that kind of bothers me. (laughs) Stop and ask yourself why. So this actually didn't sit well with me. I don't know about you guys, but he instructs us to rejoice in the Lord. Um, That word rejoice also means to be well, to thrive, or to be of good cheer. So show of hands, I want some participation this morning. How many of y'all feel like I'm thriving? I am thriving. (laughs) All right, Grant, way to go. (laughs) Okay, and show of hands, how many are surviving? I relate to, I relate to you a lot, okay? So we're going to come back to this because I really believe that as we unpack the rest of these verses, um, it flows naturally into a state of rejoicing. And he does command us to rejoice, but as we go through the rest of what he's saying, we're going to set ourselves up with a better foundation to actually live a life of joy. So next passage says, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is to safeguard, it is a safeguard for you. Safeguard, I was like, what is that? What does that mean? Safeguard means it is certainty, security, and truth for you to hold on to. So listen up, right? It's a safeguard. Paul is giving us um, these foundational truths, something that will give us ultimate certainty and security in our lives. He then warns us, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. He's warning the people of the Church of Philippi against false teachers. People who put their trust and hope in the flesh in making themselves clean before God by their own human efforts. He's referring to the old way of doing things. For the Jewish people, um, their way of getting right with God was through Jewish law. And part of that was circumcision at eight days old. And here Paul says, people that are boasting and making themselves appear righteous by all the right things they've done are evil. And especially those that require other people to do the same things in order to be made right in God's eyes. And now we have this new way of getting right with God. This is the real teaching, not the false teaching, right? He says, we are the circumcision. Yes! (laughs) Anyone else like, yay, (laughs) do I want to be the circumcision? I don't know. What does that mean? Um, He says, we are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit. How is it that we go from being required to get circumcised as a way of being presentable to God to now being the circumcision? After Jesus' finishing work on the cross, the Holy Spirit came to dwell in our hearts. When we worship by the Spirit, he's in our hearts. Therefore, so is the justifying power of Jesus' blood dwelling within us. We are the circumcision because of our communion with Holy Spirit. We don't need to go chasing um, those things on our own efforts anymore. In fact, Paul calls that evil. He goes on to say that when he himself did everything by the book, his zeal actually ended up persecuting persecuting those that were living as disciples of Jesus. He missed it entirely. He was boasting about how he missed it entirely. As for zeal, persecuting the church. It's really interesting. (laughs) Now, I was trying to relate this to my own life because... I don't know about you guys, but I'm not going around um, pressuring my friends to get circumcised or, um, (laughs) or, you know, just like that general pressure of um, religious practices that I wouldn't say that that marks the majority of us in this room. So how can we take this truth and relate it to what we might be going through today? Um. So back to that warm-up question. What are the things you boast in? For some, it may be achievements, some success, good looks, nice things, a perfect family, an amazing career, money. 
A few years back, um, a friend of ours in Hawaii gave me this prophetic word that I didn't quite understand in the moment, and he said that I was like Atlas, the Greek god. (laughs) And this image he shared with me was this one. Um, Atlas is holding the whole world in his hands. And I have an Atlas complex. I know that's not really a thing, but it is now. So I feel the weight of responsibility, of independence and strength to an unhealthy degree. I was raised to be a strong, independent woman, and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? But what it has done is it has put this weight of responsibility that I can carry it. I don't need nobody else. (laughs) Um, It's not the best way to live. Just going to throw that out there. So it's important that we understand that heart condition. Like, where is that weight of responsibility stemming from? The desire that, the desire to be in control of my circumstances, the need to appear put together, the fear that if I don't take care of all the details in my life, that the world is going to fall apart. To think that I carry that much power, right? <laughs> and to think that I put, apply that much pressure to myself on a daily basis, that if I don't carry this, the world will collapse. Um, this is going to be different for everybody, and I'm still in this journey. I got this word a couple of years ago, so I am constantly taking the world off my shoulders. Um, but, but what I want you to consider is, one, that warm-up question, what are the things you boast in? But also... What causes you to get uptight, stressed, anxious, depressed, and why? Because there's something at the root of that. I was, as I was preparing for this talk, I was thinking about how at three or four years old, we start to ask our kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I just was so challenged that I'm not going to ask my kids that question anymore because what I'm saying specifically to my daughter, is that what she does is who she is, right? And that's just not it at all. Paul is calling us back into the importance of being versus doing. So it's very important that we get this part right. It's foundational, Paul says. It's security for our lives. And this is the whole gospel. It wasn't Jesus and us on the cross that paid all our debt. I know you guys know this stuff, right? But sometimes our actions don't reflect the whole gospel. It was not me and Jesus on the cross that paid the debt for everybody. It wasn't Jesus' efforts and our own striving to make ourselves clean that wiped away sin. It was Jesus, period. In Hawaii, there's a word, um, pow, P-A-U. Sarah knows it. It popped into my head as I was preparing this part of the talk because it means finished, done. It was Jesus on the cross, his blood shed for us so that we may have life and life abundantly. Pow. That's it. You don't get to add yourself in there. Right? You don't get to sneak your own efforts into the, into the gospel. It's just Jesus. So it's really important that we understand the whole gospel because if we understand a fragmented gospel, eventually, um, you know, our circumstances are going to fail us. And then if we're linked to that, we're going to start feeling insecurity and shame about ourselves. It's just, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. So if you need that reminder, take that three-letter word, pow, as if you start to let yourself and your own efforts creep in there, say, nope, nope, this isn't mine to carry. Pow. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on in the scripture. It says, um, Paul goes on to do a little boasting. I kind of like this part. He says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, 
as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul aced it when it came to human effort. He was the best. And I'm going to be honest, I don't relate to Paul at all. (laughs) I don't feel like I'm acing it or winning at life, right? But the pressure of winning or gaining approval or winning one's favor, that's what that that word confidence meant, remember, was to win one's favor. That pressure of that is still there for me. So when we live out of human effort, we end up seeking human approval. But when we lean on God's effort, we will seek God's approval, which is the most important thing. So when we elevate our own efforts or our works, our value mistakenly gets placed in the outcome of our work. I kind of touched on this earlier, but if our circumstances are going wonderfully, our works tell us we're valuable. God is good. Everything is great. I just got that promotion. Thank you, God, right? What if our circumstances are going poorly? Y'all ever encounter difficulty? No? Just me? (laughs) If our value is tied to our own effort and suddenly our life is crumbling, how are we going to view ourselves? Your circumstances tell you, of course this would happen to me. Why me? Doesn't God know Doesn't he care about me at all? Suddenly, my circumstances are dictating to me about my poor performance. You should have tried harder. You should have done more. Shame suddenly has a stronghold in my life, and fear will keep me from from taking risks in the future. I will become uh, crippled, right? So this is completely countercultural. The majority of people we interact with on a daily basis understand their identities in light of their circumstances and performance. Would you agree? That's how the world operates. So it's easy for us to see other people soaring in life and question what we're missing. What am I doing wrong? Because my life feels difficult. But it's vitally important that we don't compare ourselves to the world. We're called to walk in freedom, and we must plant ourselves firmly in this truth so we can have great impact on the world. Putting confidence in our own flesh and striving will only lead to evil, to toiling, to anxiety, depression, pride, destruction, and insecurity. So why did Paul share this with the church again? To safeguard their faith, to give their faith security. And I love that Paul doesn't leave anything mysterious in this passage. Bless him. It's so clear. He goes on and tells us exactly how to walk in freedom. So in verse 7 it says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more... I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So as I was reflecting on this passage This was the image that I got. As you're looking through these pictures, I want you to ask yourself, what emotions do they evoke for you? His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Come to me, all who are weary and heavily burdened by religious rituals that provide no peace, and I will give you rest, refreshing your souls with salvation. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, following me as my disciple, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest, renewal, 
Blessed quiet for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and my burden is light. When we're babies, we're found in our mamas or our dadas or our caretakers. Abiding is natural and necessary. There's no task list for that newborn, right? <laughs> no to-do list that awaits that baby, just a beautiful dance with our caretaker. And what happens? We begin to grow rapidly because we're not striving. We're merely responding to nurture and connection. Then we become toddlers and we begin to mimic our caretakers. We make noises and facial expressions like our caretakers or our siblings, some of them good, some of them not so good. But our growth is a response to who we are found in, who, who we put our trust in, who we are close to, who we find connection with, who we lean on for comfort, who we confide in, who we can be honest, raw, and vulnerable with. You often hear that kids are more raw with their emotions around their parents, right? Because they can trust us. Because they have real, honest connection with us. Because they're found in us. They know they can be exactly who they are with no shame. So this phrase, to be found, this is what I want to kind of hone in on this morning as the answer to um, combating our own striving in our own human effort. To be found also means to find by thought, examination, scrutiny, observation, by practice and experience, to see, learn, discover, and understand, to be present, to be recognized, to show oneself out. I love that one. That's that, what that toddlers do with their parents, to show oneself out. Here I am, my completely messy, raw, vulnerable self. To be found out. To get knowledge of and come to know God. So the topic I've been dancing around all morning is identity, right? That's what our value is, identity. The story you're telling yourself about you. And what determines our identities? It depends on our maturity in Jesus. Last week, Bill shared a photo of four stages of maturity in the Christian walk, and the last one said, self-love for God's sake. That's that identity piece. What you believe about you will determine your striving versus your working out of an overflow. What if you believe your value is determined by a heavenly father that sacrificed everything to be in intimate relationship with you, that you are loved and seen and cared for? It is through our being found in him that our identities will begin to root into our hearts in a way that influences everything we do. And this is a sermon for another day, but we're called to do some stuff, right? So if you're sitting here going, so no human effort, like what am I supposed to do? Just like be a sloth? Just not do anything? Because I can be like that. Like, oh, I don't have to do anything. God's got it. He's, he's created us to do some stuff. But it, it comes back to that condition of our heart. Are we doing it out of an overflow or out of striving? So when our identities come into alignment with the whole finished work of the gospel and we worship by Holy Spirit, meaning the manifest presence of God is leading our lives, then out of that will flow very fruitful and healthy works. Done in human strength, yes, I do actually have to prepare this sermon, right? <laughs> Done in human strength, but also in the power of God and in the leading of God. And to bring this really full circle, we talked about rejoicing right at the beginning of this sermon, right? Striving, or thriving versus surviving. 
striving will always kill joy. So if we read that passage and go rejoice in the Lord, and then we just muscle our way through it, that's not joy, (laughs) right? When we begin to surrender to the leading of the Holy Spirit, joy and rejoicing will just flow. So we can't take the, what am I trying to say? Like we have to start with the heart condition and out of that will flow joy. We can't just muster up and go, I'm going to be joyful today. It's so much deeper than that. And it's actually exactly what Paul was talking about. We can't start with the external things. We have to start with the internal things and out of that will flow the external Okay, so I have a couple action steps for us this week. Maybe we're at the beginning. We're trying to decipher what our motives are, what our heart intentions are, and that's a good place to be. Um, The first action step is going to look, you guys are going to hate it. I'm sorry already. (laughs) Surrender, surrender, surrender. You're like, what does that mean? Adriana, what does that mean? Sometimes when I surrender, well, first of all, like we all have to be spending time with God on some level, even if it's just like driving in the car, driving your kids to school, right? Allowing the silence and the space to be dedicated to him. But a lot of times when I surrender, it looks like I wrote it three times for a reason because my surrender looks like this. (laughs) And then it looks like this. And then like this, and then like this, and then I'm probably flat on the face, flat on my flat on the ground on my face, right? So surrender, surrender, surrender. We have to be willing to let go of the things that we think are important, the things we're boasting in, the things we're finding value in, that God's not calling us to find value in. We have to give it back to Him. It doesn't mean we don't get those things, right? But we can't be like, no, it's mine. <laughs> I will have that promotion. <laughs> we, have to, we have to release it back to him and allow him to do the work in us. And that's a heart condition thing. The second action step is renewal of our minds. Um, I think this comes only through communion and partnership with Holy Spirit. And it's... Um, it is the walk of the Christian life, renewing your mind. We're faced every single day with people that get their identities from the stuff that they do. And if that's what we're being inundated with all day, every day, we have to know where we stand. Maybe we have a hard day. You know, um, here's an example. I love my family. My my family highly esteems higher education. And I was a theater arts major. <laughs> I got my bachelor's degree. And the first question I heard was, when are you going to get your master's? I was like, I don't think I am. I think I'm going to go work for a church. <laughs> um, very countercultural, right? And that's what I'm talking about. Like in Thanksgiving dinners, did any of those things come up for you guys? I had to know exactly where Holy Spirit was leading me so that I could answer that question confidently and not think that I'm lesser than because I didn't go get my master's degree. And I don't think my family thinks that about me either. But there's that pressure, right, to be a certain thing. And we have to constantly be renewing our minds with our partnership with Holy Spirit to go, this is, this is actually what's most important in my life. And this is my value. All right, the third one, prophetic acts. How to explain this. Basically, the prophetic act is bringing the spiritual into the physical realm. So an example of this is... Um, that atlas complex that I have, that weight of responsibility. What I've sensed God telling me in this season is that laughter is medicine for my soul. 
Laughter is my prophetic act. Everything I do in this season of, li- of life, I'm chasing after laughter because I believe that God has breakthrough for me when I do that. That's a prophetic act. It's saying I'm not there yet, but I can see where I want to be and I can do something in the physical realm to fight the battle to get there. Laughter is not, you can't laugh and strive at the same time. It's impossible. (laughs) Laughter comes quite naturally, right? So you have to, you just laugh and then the like, the responsibility just flies right off. It brings me, it centers me into childlikeness. Another prophetic act would be worship, right? We don't always believe what we sing, but engaging in worship is engaging in a spiritual battle in the physical world, and it's taking us to an area that we want to be, but we're not yet. It's, it's a heart condition thing. And then lastly, identity statements. I don't have time to like really unpack this this morning, so if you want to know more about this, come talk to me. Um, but what I felt like as I was talking about identity is that quite often in the church we'll say something like, Izzy, you are a daughter of the king. And I'm not mocking that. She is a daughter of the king. Okay? Bill, you're a son of the king. Yes. But what does that mean? Those are your generic identities. We are all children of God. Okay? But what I felt like God was saying to me is, you need to light a fire in your soul with your identity. Because if the fire is not lit and you engage with the world, you're done. Right? You need to like not just kind of know, kind of know who you are. You need to like really know who you are. You need to know what your gifts are. You need to know what battle you were created for. And you need to know that it all is for the glory of God. It's not for yourself promoting anything. It's just for him. But it's, it's being found in him. It's spending time with him and asking Holy Spirit, who am I? What did you create me for? What season am I in? What have I learned through my trials and my sufferings that I can carry with me to the world? It's like a very specific identity. So that's my challenge for us as a church, is that we, we don't generically know who we are, but I think that's helpful. We like really take hold of it. You got to know who you are and what you were created for. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this message and would like to learn more, you can join us in person or online for services at 10 a.m. on Sundays. We would also love to connect with you. You can fill out a connect card on our website at collectivechurch.org and also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.